she can make her own way. And even if she asked me now, I'd like, let her go alone. But I used to see her up the chapel when she went to Sunday Mass. And when she got up to receive, I kneel down there and watch her pass. The glory of her ass. I used to love her. She was on a party at our fast, just water and black tea. I walked straight up and made an ostentatious contribution. I winked at her to tell her I seduce her in the future. I wish she'd be looser, 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 looser. I used to love her, I used to love her once. A long time ago, I used to love her, I used to love her. Tell you a simple story. The morning that uh, the first time they went to number one was with the song I used to love her. Um, mass in Chum is a quarter past eleven, and Josie and myself always go to mass at quarter past eleven. But uh, the top thirty were on, and uh, they weren't over till half eleven. And I said, "We're not going, just We have to wait." But, so they weren't. They weren't. Uh, they weren't number five. They weren't number four. They weren't number three. The word number two, and just at three minutes to half eleven, the last song comes on, and at number one, it was the Saw Doctors, was I used to love her, but we went crazy because that was their first taste. We thought it was beautiful, great. As a matter of fact, I cried, honestly, I cried because I thought it was a great break for them, and they brought something to tune that I think no factory or no industry could replace. They were an industry in themselves. That brought hope to Joan, life to Joan, and some great spirits. This year we'd played the, the Fla in Finsbury Park, and we'd played in the Phoenix Park in Dublin, and we'd played in Fela, and down in Turles, in Tipperary, and we'd played to huge audiences, you know, and we were saying, well, why can't we do it in Joan? Because it's our hometown. So we said, they've been so good to us and so supportive. Why can't we do something for Joan and have the same kind of event? because Tune was a great old town and we thought it might bring a bit of life into the town and it worked. I'd say they've never ever seen it like that in this town before. They've had flag holes and stuff. They've never seen such uh, concentrated kind of enjoyment. It was so exciting and everything went so well. And there was music all over the town of Tune in every pub and every street and every little laneway and, and alley of the town. It was music. It was absolutely brilliant.
very temperamental. But these boys are the most temperamental people I've ever come across, and they are fabulous. <laughs> We're very. Hey, Pierce. Pierce looks like he's going to get a heart attack. I'm trying to throw them into shape. They're coming on, you see, for a song near the end, and uh, we're trying to get them to line up and do the, it's a kind of a formation dance. Not a hope. Not a hope. Diversity in our songs comes from all the things you ever heard on the radio from when you were probably no years old to, to now and hearing sounds like tremolo guitars and melodic songs and just anyone who had that kind of thing and sounds we liked and I suppose they've all found some little part in, in our repertoire. I think one of the liveliest songs we have and it's become very, very popular with people that are familiar with the music, is a song called The Irish Post. And it's about a lad emigrating from Ireland to England. And it's um, a humorous song. It's, he gets sick in Hollyhead. And, and we, we played it after I used to love her in Manchester, and the crowd just go completely haywire. Because at that stage, our elastic bands have gone, and we're ding. So it's, it's a good, good crack song to go daft to.
that's the first instrument I learned to play was an electric guitar, loud electric guitar. I mean, I just learned bar chords and that. When punk music became very big in Tumen, 76, 77. Uh, Leo and I had been at school together in the same class, and one day we got this great notion that we were going to change Tumen and be different than everybody else in the class. So Leo put on this really ridiculous communion suit that he had and the kind of legs were up here and the sleeves were up here. And I put on my, one of my dad's old suits and the sleeves were out there and the legs were down there. And we were walking around the town and I'm sure people must have been thinking at the time, look at the state of them, you know? Nobody in tune actually ever knew what punk really was like, only through music and television and whatever. But I'm sure everyone made up their own mind that they, they were punk. I was 13 and up until I was more than 18, I would say, maybe 20. I had no time for traditional music. I was, uh, I have them here, I have all the Stranglers albums, the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Ramones, that was me. You know, and then it was kind of like Bruce Springsteen, Tom Waits, uh, that type of thing that I, that I had uh, grown up loving and not having any time for the diddly eye block with the fiddle in the pub, you know, not having enough sauce to respect it. But eventually, I think you come to a point where you're born in the land, and the, the tunes seem to emanate from the actual land and from the sounds you hear in the, in the country. And they come out through you, you know, and, and it comes to a point where you can't avoid them anymore. And we have Terps in the band who's been playing traditional music for quite a while, and his father is a traditional singer for years and years. And he is 
he has a huge traditional input into it. But I think it's in us as well. Well, I remember my grandfather used to play the fiddle. He used to play it the real old style, down like that. Kind of wild fiddle player. And my dad used to sing a lot. He played with um, a local family here called the Kane family. Um, Dolores Kane, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But he used to sing with the Kane family. Many rivers of Ireland are thin the world o'er. But now to that number we'll adjust one more. It's a sweet little river I'll sing off to you of a stream called the Sulin that flows through Clunto. Sure, it's not a great river, it's just a small stream. But in far away lands, many times in my dreams, I have seen the dear Sulin far over the blue, as it quietly meanders along by Clunto. In the days long ago, the itinerant class never paid a red cent for a feed for an ass. They just turned them out loose like they all used to do. To graze round the Suleen, the flows through Clunto. There's a bridge across the river, not far from the plan. I have sported and fled there from boyhood to man. Over the city, the flows should bloom too. Now there's fish in the city, and Jarrow's galore. Oh, sure, why would you go all the way to Clumbor? You can catch all you want from Snipe Lodge to Classroom. If you fish in the city, the flows should bloom too. Suleen waters can banish all ills. So forget about spas and quack doctors and pills. Just strip off your clothes down the old moony room and bathe in the Suleen the flows through Clown Now around Clown Harbor, there's many fair scenes to compare. songs and uh, the the lyrical content is, is phenomenally good um, but often often people ask uh, do you think there's a problem with the, the colloquialism of the, of the material but uh, I mean I, th I personally feel that'd be like asking Bruce Springsteen if he, you, you know he thought it was a bit colloquial you know talking singing songs about Asbury Park like it's, it, they're just they're singing and writing songs that come from the heart and from what they know, and the excellent songs that stand up uh, with the best of them. Universal relevance was a, a theme we discussed in poetry in school, I suppose everybody did. And it seemed that, that uh, the, the smaller the detail, the larger the, it could be applied. 
and uh, a lot of our details are very small. I couldn't believe it that there were some that these blokes in tune were writing these songs that I could relate to, even though I was from Carindona, which was 200 miles away, because we had the girls walking up and down the street with the red cortinas, and I was down the N17 the year before that on my way to America. So they all meant something to me. So that's, they grabbed me like. Anyway, this is a song about my first girlfriend. It's called Red Cortina. <laughs> Factory house outside the town Pretty name I can't remember Christmas party, he's 77 Heartbeat like an earthly tremble First love stays with you forever First love stays with you forever and ever Heartbeat like an earthly tremble First love stays with you forever ever I try to meet you Your father used to drop you off You'd step out of a red cartina You look so pretty on those winter mornings First love stays with you forever First love stays with you forever and ever You look so pretty on those winter mornings First love stays with you forever One moment. Let's go out to start the song. Oh, yeah. Sun still shining through the window. Dew just about to blossom. First love stays with you forever. First love stays with you forever and ever. Oh, you were just about to blossom. First love stays with you forever.
Now as I tumble down highways I felt the overcrowded trains There's no one to talk to in transit So sit there and daydream in vain And behind all these modern up problems Living on a foreign soil You still see the twist and turns in the road Davey had the, the line, uh, I wish I was on the N17. I suppose we were following in the tradition of Route 66 there. And uh, they got married up, a fella wishing he was on the N17. It's slightly ironic because it's the, if you, a fella being away from home uh, who's used to hitching up and down the N17 or traveling it, uh, it'd be you know, kind of frustrating to be on the N17 because it's that close to home and you're not quite there, like, you know? And it's it's quite a, a long, an, a, a, it's not the most scenic of roads in the country, so it's um, it's, it's slightly ironic. I wish I was on the N17. You'd wish you were home, like you know. But I suppose it's it's the it's being that close to home is, is what he's wishing. Leo writes a lot of poetry, but uh, I think a lot of people learn about the poems through music quicker than they'd actually pick it up and read it. You know. Although I hear now that the N17 has actually gone on the uh, the junior cert course in Ireland. Be, like it's going to be an official exam piece next year. So that's encouraging that the poem has actually gone beyond the song. And it's actually made it onto a, a curriculum for students, you know. It says a lot for the writing. We'll play the next song. It's a, it's a kind of a romantic song, really, I suppose. We played for John Donnelly, who's such a romantic character here on this. To play the drums. He's one of the most romantic drummers in the world. 14 years old. McDermott is his name. He uh, accosted me one day and said the saw doctors are looking for a drummer. Well, I'd never heard of the saw doctors. 
So uh, he gave me a phone number. I rang the phone number and I got in touch with Leo. I was chatting to Leo and Leo organised that the following week I come to tune and rehearse with him and audition with him. So that was grand. So that weekend before I was going rehearsing with him, uh, there was a knock on the door and my grandmother answered the door and Terps and Leo were at the door and she came in to me and said, there's two Swedish blokes at the door, strange looking men. I didn't know what, and said, she said they were looking for me. I didn't know who they were. So I went out the door anyways, and Terps and Leo were there, and I called them in, and they said they were the sound actors, and they had a cassette for me to listen to. So we brought them into the dining room, we sat down, and I was chatting away, and I found them very strange. It's just their attitude, and during that as well, they were breaking into their tune slang, which I'd never heard of before. And I went out to the kitchen, and said, God, Folks are weird, just like, you know, talking funny languages and everything. It's really strange. So I had the cassette with me, so I said, God, put on the cassette. I was making tea at the time for them. And I heard two songs, and I just said, oh, no, <laughs> it's a country band. Because the two songs that I heard were country bands, was from the gig. So I said, oh, no. So I got the cassette, and I just threw it over across the room. I said, come on, make the pot of tea and let these fellas go home. and get them out of the house. I don't know who they are. So I'm back inside anyways, and they just stayed and chatted for about hours and hours. And at that stage, my mother was coming in saying, they're not gone yet. I said, no, no, they're not. They're getting there, we're getting there. Because uh, after that, then I invited them out for a game of snooker up home, just get them out of the house. Because <laughs> I just couldn't understand them. They're tube slang and what have you. I didn't know where they were coming from. So uh, they went anyways that evening. It was grand. I thought that was it, you know, job done. The following week then, uh, they rang me and the water boys were playing the Olympia from Dublin. And they asked me to go up with them. So I went up with them that night and I've been stuck with them ever since. I suppose we don't very much feel like we're on a stage. Like, it's nice to be, to be at one with the audience. Because we're lucky, it's a privileged position, so you just kind of say, well, this is our turn, it'll be somebody else's turn next time. Hopefully we just all have a good night out. I think, really, they're developing, obviously, um, as, as they are young musicians. As they learn their craft, they're developing. And as they learn new techniques, and the music will develop with that. And I'm just part of that. I'm just, uh, you know, they're experimenting with the sounds. And I can provide those sounds and we can, you know, experiment together. Joe Wall and myself are very, very good friends. We live together in Galway. Uh, we eat dinner together every evening and we go out together and we talk about things like women and girls and women. And uh, sometimes myself and Joe have crossed paths with various females, I suppose. And that's how Joe Wall broke my heart happened. Ken Binley walked in one night and just said, Pierce, Joe Wall broke my heart. And Leo standing there being the psychological bully that he is, just straight away pen to paper. That's a song. Joe Wall can be anybody. It's not a personal slag in Joe. It took me weeks to get to talk to her. She said I'd have a drink. Just when the clock is starting, and what's who do you think? She couldn't take her eyes off him. Joe Wall broke my heart. He's six foot three and handsome. He wears his hair real long. If he picks up any instrument, he'll surely sing a song. He's a god under the sculpture.
Cause his sharpest razor blades is quick to land a hand. He can fry a foreign old cuisine. He's even in a stunning bar. They were standing in a garden wall, 15 feet up high. Hard as the whole walk away with him. Joe broke my heart. Joe broke my heart. playing in pubs and we had kind of two speakers and the audience were right in front of us dancing and we're on the same level <coughs> of the floor and then we went playing in, in halls which were kind of say nightclubs and that which was 200 people 150 people and we had actual monitors you know this was this was an extra that we had and we were going wow we can actually hear ourselves singing this is brilliant so we're playing in small clubs and then we actually moved on to to large venues like sea point are the International in Manchester and the Town and Country Club. And we're up on kind of stages which are above the, the audience, but no matter how high the stage ever becomes, it never lifts us from the audience because there's always a great bond between us and the audience, and I don't think we'll ever lose that. They might get a laugh or they might get a cry. It might touch some kind of a thing in them that, that's, that's everybody's. My favourite song of all time has to be a song which Leo wrote and when he, when he actually played it to me, he didn't play it to me, he showed me the lyrics. When he showed me the lyrics, I just said to him, I said, Leo, that's the best I think you've ever done. And it's a song called The Powerful Song. And uh, there's just something about it that touches me. When they want to ruin our province, just to turn it into gold. When they think our greatest asset can be mined over fine soul. Factories are all closing like they are in our hometown. And your friends are looking out for one that's nowhere to be found. When the spirits they need rising to be happy, proud, and strong, it's time to sing, it's time to sing. Someone that I met somewhere else. 
Songwriting really it was my kind of. I'm not I'm not a brilliant guitar player or anything like that, but, but I can write a song. It's impossible for me to predict anything about the Saw Doctors because if you sat here with me two years ago, I wouldn't have got within an ass's roar of what happened. And I'd say even if you sat down with me six months ago, I probably wouldn't get it within an ass's roar of what what happened. So it's really like uh, I always think we're it's like um, it's like playing a game of football. We're in the we're in the heat of battle all the time, and it's getting the next ball that counts. That's what you need. And it's not, uh, it's not the final whistle or anything, it's the next ball. And I think when the game is over, we'll all have a great laugh. I think our motto would be, stop us if you want. That'd be a good motto to have, wouldn't it? You don't say how you love him, but it shows in every word. When he played his favorite music, was it best? You tell me that he couldn't watch the violence cut by men When all is quiet throughout the land Hope you'll meet again I hope you'll meet again I hope you'll meet again 